thank you all for coming to our panel, which I think is called Mobilization, Mobilized Actors and Activism. I'm your moderator, Malcolm Harris. I'm a senior editor with the Green Inquiry. Uh, I'm going to introduce our panelists in just a second. I'm going to ask you to hold applause until I'm done introducing everybody, and then you can give them a clap after they each talk. I'm also going to thank our uh, hashtag moderator, Heather Rosenfeld, who's in front of me. Give her a little clap. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to be introducing our panelists in order of appearance from stage left to stage right. <laughs> First is Elizabeth Saldana, who is a student in ethnicity, race, and migration at Yale University. Her thesis focuses on the use of Twitter in the Occupy Balbatar protests and the Trayvon Martin protests. To her left is Laura Meadows who's at the University of North Carolina, Asheville. Chapel Hill. Chapel Hill. <laughs> <laughs> to her left is Laura Horowitz Staser, who teaches at the nexus of what, consumer politics and radical activism, which is also close to the title of her book, which is <laughs> Left Out Politics and Radical Activism. <laughs> Available now from Bloomsbury. <laughs> <laughs> to her left is Adrian Masanari, who's at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And her book on Reddit politics is coming out in 2015. So give them Reddit culture. Not no, right. Right. Yeah, it's fine. So. Give them all a round of applause. I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in. On November 19, 2012, a young woman arrived in the Tribhuvan International Airport in Kathmandu, Nepal. Sita Rai was returning from working as a domestic in Saudi Arabia. Upon arrival at the airport, immigration officials noticed that she was traveling on a fake passport and detained her along with 15 other women. After a few hours in detention, an immigration officer, Sonmat Kanal, demanded a bribe of about 218,000 Nepalese rupees, or around 2,500 US dollars, to ensure that she would not be prosecuted for traveling without documentation. Sita paid the bribe and lost most of the money she had earned while working abroad. Kanal eventually let her go, and a police officer, Parsram Basnet, offered to escort Sita to the bus park on November 21, 2012. He took her to a lodge near the bus park and repeatedly raped her. He threatened her and told her to tell no one about the robbery or the rape. And a few weeks later, however, she broke down and she told her older sister and brother. Um, and her brother enlisted the help of women's organizations and the media to bring charges against Kanal and Basnet. By December 12th, human rights or advocates and women's organizations in Kathmandu were already staging sit-ins and demonstrating for justice for Sita. Her brother filed a complaint with the Ministry of Home Affairs on December 23rd, 2012. On December 28th, approximately 40 activists showed up outside of Balutar, the residence of then Prime Minister Babaram Bhattarai. They each signed a petition that had been circulated through email and Twitter, which they intended to deliver to the Prime Minister. As they gathered, the Nepal police told them they had no right to be there and forcibly removed them from the premises. After the incident with the police, activists met to discuss their next steps. Someone in the group mentioned Occupy Wall Street, to which another activist joked, hey, we're Occupy Balutar. Arpan Shrestha, tweeted, the Occupy Balatar sit-in protest will carry on today. Concludes at 6 with a candle vigil. Please drop by for a few minutes. Please support. And with that tweet, Occupy Balatar was born. I make two important assumptions in this talk. First, drawing on the work of Judith Butler, Doug McAdam, and Nepali movement theorist MK Karki, I understand social movements as contests both in public space and about public space. They occur in public spaces through demonstrations, protests, marches, or public discussions and debates. People act in concert. Sometimes they are organized and purposeful, and sometimes they are not. Movements are also debates about public spaces. I see movement participants as individuals who have been excluded from public space in some way, either socially, economically, or politically. Their words have been silenced, their bodies violated, or their voices stripped from them. Themes of exclusion, silencing, and access to public space are crucial to conversations about the internet and its democratizing potential, particularly in regards to developing countries like Nepal. Second, this talk takes seriously the call to abandon the digital dualist assumption, where online and offline are somehow separate. If we buy the idea that there is no fundamental difference between online and offline spaces, then access to online spaces 
must be as much of a priority for inclusivity within movements as it is in offline spaces. Internet in inaccessibility has serious implications for offline mobilization. Indeed, Occupy Balatar shows us that the online space of social media is both the site in which movement occurs through digital activism, but is also itself a source of conflict about strategies, class, and mobilization. I argue that social media impacted Occupy Balatar at a local, regional, and global level, hence the sort of map structure of the way this is going to go. And the story of Occupy Balatar raises important questions about the digital divide in a number of ways. Examine, examine three levels of space, a micro space, the city of Kathmandu, an intermediate space, the region of South Asia, with particular attention to the relationship between India and Nepal, and a macro space, or the world. <laughs> um, taken together, these different levels of public space, online and offline, show us that despite its democratizing promise, the internet both reflects and reifies global economic, social, and political disparities between countries. My first exposure to Occupy Balatar was through Twitter. Um, activists use social media, particularly Twitter. I didn't really get access to the sort of closed networks on Facebook. Um, but they use Twitter to amplify news articles, stories, and information about protests. They tweeted amongst themselves, um, especially in the early days. Twitter served as a tool to bring a small group of people into the streets to help with protests. Activists tweeted news stories in both Nepali and English. They also tweeted scathing remarks to the Prime Minister, asking him to launch an investigation and reprimanding his slow responses to their requests. Occupy Balatar digital activists directly addressed Badarai through Twitter, which they could not do offline in person due to security reasons. Um, Balatarai also occasionally responded to complaints and tweets addressed to him, which enabled act activists to have a two-way conversation rather than struggling to move through security and public space to address him directly. Twitter was an organizational tool among a small number of activists. Approximately 26 users produced the majority of tweets since the movement began. I thought that these activists, these Twitter activists, were the primary organizers of the movement, were the ones who were responsible for bringing people out into the streets. When I went to Nepal, however, it was a very different picture than the one that I was seeing online. And as one activist and social media expert told me with a sardonic smile, the people online were not always the ones running the show. In contrast to Twitter activists, another group of Occupy Balwaktar activists to whom I refer as inward-looking activists sought to empower ordinary Nepalis. Bidushi, an, an activist and journalist with the Kathmandu Post, told me, quote, so after that first day, some of us said, okay, how do we make this inclusive? You know, so that it would include non-upper middle class, English speaking elite Nepalis. We wanted to include everyone. We tried to use very grassroots style of organization. We made posters in Nepali and they were black and white and we did them on sheet paper. We didn't have a lot of money, so that was easier to do. And I mean, our posters looked awesome. I remember one time we took like 300 flyers and four motorcycles and just went and hung them in the middle of the night." End quote. These inward-looking activists tried to speak to Nepalis in their own language. They relied less on social media, but rather on phone trees, word of mouth, cheaply produced posters made from homemade materials, or public performances like arrests, street theater, and graffiti to establish a movement that was focused on Nepalis themselves. Bidushi and several other activists saw ordinary Nepalis from all walks of life as the primary source of political power for the movement. According to another activist, Ishan, who I'll get to later, Nepal needed to, quote, pe needed people to be active, to step into leadership positions to deal with problems, end quote. For these inward-looking activists, it was important to galvanize the support and political strength of low-income, low-caste, and non-English-speaking Nepalis living in Kathmandu. This division among these activists stems from an important discussion about the digital divide and how it works at this sort of micro level of Kathmandu. According to the UN, Nepal is classified as a least developed country. The 2011 Nepali census shows that around 3.3% of Nepal has internet access. According to a social media expert, active, ex expert based in Kathmandu, that number is likely a little bit higher. If you count access to cyber cafes and mobile phones, internet pen penetration is probably closer to around 12 to 15%. Because of the high cost of personal computers, mobile phone maintenance, and internet, and, uh, and internet access in a city with rolling blackouts, uh, the internet is very much accessible only to the elites of Kathmandu. Cyber cafes have helped address the problem of internet access. For a little about, for just around a, like a dollar an hour, ne ordinary Nepalis can just sort of walk into a room full of computers and access the internet, um, which they do. Although this is comparatively cheaper than the high upfront cost of buying a personal computer or a mobile phone, it is still prohibitively expensive for many Nepalis. 
For these reasons, the Twitter activists seem to be targeting a very different group of people than were Bidushi, Ishan, and other grassroots organizers. Although Twitter activists interacted with each other in a very small local place and seemed to know each other offline, they were interacting in a digital space that was not accessible to all Nepalis. Regardless of intent to include low income, low caste, or non-digitally linked groups, Twitter activists seem to direct their activism towards elites within the city and potentially towards Nepali expatriates living abroad. These differences in strategies and targets became a point of contention for these two factions of organizers within Occupy Balwatar. They were fundamentally debates about elitism and class. At a local level, social media's impact was not to connect ordinary folks to each other, but rather served to reinforce the digital divide within the movement and within Kathmandu. These debates over strategies were part of a debate about public space and which Nepalis had access to that digitally linked public space. As the movement continued from December 2012 to the first few months of 2013, across the border, Indian activists took to the streets to protest the Delhi rape incident. So talk about that for just a second. On December 16, 2012, a six men brutally gang raped a young uh, medical student living in New Delhi. When she died from her injuries several days later, protests broke out all over India. They coincided, actually, with Occupy Balwatar. They were happening at the same time. But probably nobody heard about Occupy Balwatar because of the sort of overwhelming media uh, coverage of the, of the Delhi rape protests. Um, American commentators commenting on this issue um, knowingly cited India's patriarchal values and hostility to women as the cause of the rape, and they were not alone. Indian news media and women's advocacy groups criticized widespread sexist behaviors and practices in India as the underlying cause of this act of violence. In news comment sections online, many Nepalis weighed in on the problem of, quote, North Indian patriarchal values, end quote, that influenced Nepal. The problem of rape in Nepal, it seemed, to stem from a shared cultural history with India. In theory, Sita's case in Occupy Balwatar uh, gave Nepali advocates and activists a foothold in an international and at least regional discussion about violence against women in South Asia. However, while the Delhi incident received substantial coverage from both traditional news media and social media and activists, <laughs> Occupy Balwatar saw far less coverage despite its shared border. So what does that mean if we're looking at this regionally? Although activists in India and Nepal were dealing with similar questions of rape, women's public safety, far fewer people saw the conversation about Nepal's Occupy Balwatar movement. Within the regional public space of South Asia, the voices of Nepalis may have been drowned out uh, by the conversation happening around them. This is in no small part due to the extremely low internet penetration in Nepal. Twitter, where many of the discussions occurred about the Delhi rape case, um, is like not a particularly popular website in Nepal. Even if everyone currently on Twitter in Nepal tweeted the same thing for several hours, it's unlikely that they would be able to overpower even the sort of number of tweets about Justin Bieber, or in the case of the Delhi incident, even the voices coming from other South Asians. Um, so what does this mean globally? According to Bidushi, journalists in Kathmandu had attempted to get the attention of international news organizations, but gave up after it seemed that such organizations were much more interested in addressing the Delhi case. The digital divide constrained Nepali activists' ability to participate in a global public discussion about women's issues. At a global level, we see serious discrepancies in internet access and access to public conversations that occur online. From this, it is clear that Nepal's low position in the world vis-a-vis -vis its neighbors, India and China, is reflected and reinforced in global online public space. In part, this is due to infrastructural barriers to internet access. However, Ishan, who I mentioned earlier, suggested an alternate explanation. What he told me was that, quote, what we need is for people to step into leadership positions to deal with problems. If we are ever going to progress as a country, we need people to be active. Here's your answer. This is why social media will never work here. People are too apathetic. You have to get them to care, and that just doesn't always happen on social media." End quote. Civic engagement and activism, according to Ishan, came from different kinds of political attachment that developed between friends and individuals acting together in solidarity in public space. His understanding of the internet is that in Kathmandu, it does not mobilize or mediate or engender the types of close ties that are necessary for mobilization. For Ishan, the internet is not the answer to bring Nepalis into the mindset of solidarity, care, and concern about the future of the country. What began as a call for justice for Sita Rai became an important case study into the meanings of social media in Kathmandu, South Asia, and the world. Accessibility at a local level may not be attainable due to class differences in internet access. However, 
Ishan's comment suggests that even if it were attainable, it might not be preferable or solve the sort of underlying problem of apathy within Kathmandu. The exclusion of activists in Occupy Balatar at a regional and global level also show how the voices and stories from Nepalese are left out of digitally linked conversations because of these infrastructural barriers to these online spaces. Occupy Balatar shows us that social media's democratizing impact is still subject to real world structural and problems and conflicts, including economic development and class, caste, racial, ethnic, and gender disparities. My question for this conference, and really sort of what I ended up with at the end of this kind of sad story, is how can we create inclusive space online and offline? And a sort of secondary question is what are the consequences if we do not? Um, how can we theorize and understand a sort of non-digital dualist online and offline public space if not everyone's included? I hope that we can have a conversation about exclusion and inclusion, the accountability and contesting power in digitally linked public spaces. I hope that we can consider how the internet influences our understandings of ourselves as activists and theorists of the web and each other as local, national, and global citizens. set up actually have a question. Um, can someone say the word that means the opposite of urban? Rural. rural. Do you see how you all did that with two syllables? Mm -hmm. I'm from West Virginia from a rural area and we only use one syllable. <laughs> and so I'm going to say that word about 105 times in the next 12 minutes and as long as we understand I can spell it we'll go from there. <laughs> all right. So I'm Laura Meadows. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. It's not as cool as Asheville, so I have to be clear that. <laughs> and uh, I'm starting a job as an assistant professor at Indiana in January, so I'll be a Hoosier soon enough. Um, this paper draws on uh, ethnographic observation um, of the uh, LGBT movement in North Carolina, sort of uh, standing in for the South. Um, and I use it to answer a series of questions and to theorize the concept of movement micropublics. Um, like any southerner with her salt, it's probably best to start with a story. So, um, has anyone heard of Bakersville, North Carolina? Really? That's great. Okay, no one should have heard of it. It's in the mountains in western North Carolina. There are about 456 people that live there. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the movie Deliverance, but parts of it were filmed there, and it, it resembled, like it was, you know, purposeful. So, um, However, they have a thriving gay-straight alliance. Two women in the town thought, you know what, it's time we became visible. They created the Mitchell County Gay-Straight Alliance, and they thought, okay, we need to have an organizing meeting. So they met up at the local library, the two activists, out lesbians, with six allies who are all straight. So there's eight of them in a room trying to, what is this, what, what it should look like, what should we do? Uh, outside in the street, there are dozens of protesters. They're holding signs, God hates fags, this ain't Asheville, take your values and do with the things that you do. And so it was, it was kind of a harsh day, and it's, there's some YouTube clips on it, and uh, interesting watching. Now, two years later, uh, they, they host a reading of the Play 8 about California's Prop 8 case. Uh, they do it in the historic courthouse. There are 100 people in attendance. There are 20 people on stage for the reading, and there are no protesters. So how did this community come into being? Uh, what tools and strategies did activists create, like use to create this public? And what does that tell us about movements and digital media more generally? So over the last five years, uh, in a time of unprecedented progress for the LGBT movement generally, uh, the South continues to be seen as a void of activism, as a sort of closet. And in many ways, the region does lag behind the rest of the country. So for instance, regarding marriage equality, public opinion in support of it in the South is about 10 or 15 percentage points behind where we are in the Northeast. Um, so there's definitely work to do. But during this time, and in this sometimes antagonistic environment, 
uh, North Carolina's activists were building a vibrant, though very specific movement that reflected the region's religiosity, its rural areas, um, its racial diversity. And they developed supportive communities in the state's farm country. They um, built strong coalition ties with the state's NAACP chapters. And they organized in church pews. Um, as more than one activist told me, quote, you can't win in the South without faith. And that's a true story. But as my research has shown me, they are winning in the South, but they're doing it slowly. And they're doing it through the creation of what I'm calling movement micropublics. I'm completely not wedded to that term, so if anyone has anything more interesting, come see me after this is over. Um, but I'm really trying to get at the, the differences between groups within a movement in regards to priorities and values and how those priorities and values affect their work and their outcomes. So for example, in North Carolina, um, distinct publics have emerged around rural concerns, faith concerns, uh, campus, um, military, there's a strong military presence in the state, so there's certain concerns that have to do with the movement coming out of them. Um, in all these groups, like they organize targeted events, they host Facebook pages, they have Twitter accounts, they work in coalition with one another, but they very much are distinct groups with certain concerns in regards to the movement. And so in short, this concept recognizes that there are multiple publics operating within a single movement. So historically, at least, and certainly in the academic literature, there seem seemingly only two publics within the LGBT movement. There's like the queer radical set and then the mainstream normalizing set. And those two are always put in opposition to each other. And I, I think this grossly underestimates the dynamism within the movement and produces a sort of myopia about the sort of, sorts of goals the movement should um, pursue and where the resources need to go. And so it's my hope that a concept like movement micropublics will break down this the, the binary and, and maybe let us think more fully about the publics within the movement. Uh, today, since we don't have a ton of time, I'm going to focus uh, specifically on just one movement micropublic, and that's the one that, uh, the rural one that, that sort of centers around Bakersville. So for the you know, next 10 minutes, I'm going to talk very briefly about methods. I know this is a theory conference, but my training won't allow me not to talk about it for a moment. Um, uh, I want to discuss three ways in which these publics are created. And then uh, offer a few conclusions regarding the direction of the LGBT movement, as well as the dynamics of uh, digital media and community building more generally. So to explore these dynamics and the work that's in my dissertation, I um, present evidence largely drawn from ethnographic field work that I conducted over an 18 month span from September of 2011 uh, to January 2013. So within the state, that's the most high profile intensive LGBT movement work um, that they've ever experienced. I had access to the leading organizations within the state, such as Equality and C, Campaign for Southern Equality. I think all told, I put about 3,000 miles on my car just darting around the state. But I had backstage access to more than 50 events, uh, voter registration drives, um, town hall meetings, pride marches. Um, and it was at these events I was able to connect with both like the elite leaders of the movement as well as the grassroots activists that are actually doing the work in these communities. And then I supplemented these observations with interviews um, and then analysis of digital media and legacy media communication. So like I said, I'm going to focus specifically on the rural uh, micropublic. And I'm going to show that the public was called into being discursively and materially and then leveraged by other movement actors later. So not surprisingly, the most straightforward way in which these <coughs> movement activists stopped to create a public uh, was discursively is through social media. They set up a Facebook page. So working in, con uh, in connection with Equality and C, trying to come up with best practices for how to organize this, they created the target, targeted Facebook page and they accomplished a number of things. Um, they created awareness that a community even existed in the area. And that was for the people actually in the area as well as people throughout the state that didn't know that there was work going on here. Um, they obviously targeted the information uh, of particular relevance to this particular community. And importantly, they, because they could reach across geographical divides, they picked up community members that they didn't know they even had. So through personal networks online, they were able to, to create a pretty good um, community. You know, 600 likes doesn't sound like much, but when your community is 450, you know, it's, it's pretty decent. But as the two co-founders of the uh, Mitchell County GSC told me, 
Social media was vitally important to their ability to organize this community. Um, they both expressed doubt as to whether or not this would even be possible without Facebook and some of the affordances, affordances, you know what I'm trying to say, that it offers. Um, but they were also clear that online organizing without a significant offline component would not have produced the results they were looking for. They wanted to heighten visibility of their community amongst the public at large, not just amongst people that are already with them. And so to achieve this goal, they often sought to combine the power of online discursive community building with offline events. So for example, um, in 2012, North Carolina had a constitutional amendment that ended up banning like, marriage equality within the state. And so during that time, the campaign that was working to oppose the amendment, um, they thought it would be a good idea to bring the town's arts community uh, together with, with its evangelical Christian community. And so for an hour and a half, um, supporters and opponents of what became known as Amendment 1, they engaged in a very real dialogue about the amendment. Um, they talked about the LGBT movement generally. They talked about sin and blasphemy and salvation. And it was a very honest discussion. Um, I'm not sure that anyone in the room changed their mind at the end of it, um, but it did make the LGBT community much more visible and asserted their presence in the town. Um, Importantly, the organizers uh, purposefully and instrumentally placed two religious leaders on the panel. Uh, one of them, uh, Jasmine Beach Ferrara of the Campaign for Southern Equality. Uh, she wasn't ordained at the time, but she wore a clerical collar. Uh, and as she told me later, I was going to be a minister, and on that day I needed, to see them, I needed them to see me as a religious figure. So this event was covered in the county newspaper. The organizers quickly produced a 20-minute YouTube video. Participants tweeted, they Facebooked, um, a lot of those were, you know, reshared or retweeted, you know, dozens if not hundreds of times. And just to kind of belabor the point, this is a town that's typically been ignored uh, in regards to activism of this sort. And so this coverage was especially significant in the, in the development of their public. And as I heard from folks in Bakersville and other rural areas such as Fayetteville and Greenville, finally these groups are paying attention to us. And judging from their actions after the campaign, uh, this increased visibility. Um, it really worked to galvanize and connect their communities. So in both online and offline context, uh, activists outside of Bakersville, they've leveraged this public uh, discursively to draw attention to it and to highlight the possibility of organizing in unexpected places. So for instance, Jen Jones of Equality and C, she's one of the state's most recognizable uh, activists. Uh, she consistently um, evokes the organizing uh, efforts in Bakersville in front of um, you know, statewide audiences or national audiences or on Twitter or on Facebook. Uh, during an interview, she told me, as a communications director, I'm always looking for compelling stories. We have to convince people, especially national donors, that important work is going on in unexpected places highlighting their stories as an intention getter. Now it's important to remember there's, I think 33% of the LGBT population, like self-identified LGBT people in the country live in the South, and we get 3% of the funding nationally. So drawing attention to the work being done is absolutely important for these organizations to continue. And so I argue that there is value in being instrumental. Um, movements and politics are inextricably linked to each other and recognizing the lived realities of specific publics and working to speak to them where they are is an invaluable strategy at a moment and in a location where considerable persuasion or hearts and minds work needs to take place. People need some time sometimes to come around, so you gotta talk to them where they are. And I, I think there's power in um, combining online and, and offline uh, strategies. So both are undoubtedly powerful tools, but my work has shown me that the most effective community building Visibility generating work comes when the tools are combined. And finally, movements are not monoliths. Um, they are complicated, they're diverse, they have different values, priorities, and they're made up of myriad publics who all have unique needs. And recognizing this fact will offer us a more well-rounded, grounded picture of our communities. So, thank you. Next up is Laura Fortwood Stacey.
great. Well, I knew that was going to happen. Um, those are really great um, papers, and I'm glad to be on this panel with um, what is good research, I think. Um, and I'm really excited to be in this room with a lot of people whose work I read and cite. So it's a little scary, but um, it'll be uh, great to get feedback from all of you. Um, so I want to preface this by just saying that uh, most of the work that I'm going to be drawing from today is um, online. And I will um, tweet a link to my website that has all the references and all the um, links that you can check out. So Facebook turned 10 years old in February. Some of us in this room, not me, but maybe some of you in this room have been on Facebook for 10 years. Maybe, anyone? No? Okay, okay, good. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people in this room are um, approaching our 10 year anniversaries. So in thinking about this upcoming anniversary, um, I was reminded of this proposal by a women's advocacy group in the Philippines. And they put forth this proposal that state-recognized marriage contracts would expire after 10 years, unless the two parties to the marriage actively renewed the contract. Um, and the marriage would not continue unless people decided, OK, after 10 years, we want to re-up it. We want to go again. So setting aside how that would actually work for real marriages, I find it useful as a thinking tool, because my research is about how some people walk away from media technologies. And so my question is at this 10 year mark in our relationship with Facebook, what would it mean not to renew that contract? If relationships take work, as the saying goes, what would it mean to decide not to put in that work in our relationship to media technology? So media refusal is a term that I use to refer to the conscious disavowal of media. And this can take the form of rejecting a specific platform, a specific technology, a corporation. And I'm not just interested in Facebook. I use the case of Facebook refusal to, implore, to explore the broader implications of this kind of relationship to media. In popular discourse, such rejection is often termed opting out. And in fact, many of the popular press pieces about people quitting Facebook do use the metaphor of a breakup. This is something that we see kind of over and over again in this discourse. My intellectual interest in the refusal phenomenon is tied to my broader research agenda on what I call lifestyle activism. And this is what my book that Malcolm so generously plugged earlier um, was about. Basically, uh, in this work that I'm doing on media refusal, I look at practices of refusal as tactical responses to the perceived harms engendered by a capitalist system in which media corporations have disproportionate power over their platform's users, who, it may be said, provide unpaid labor for corporations whenever they log on. So while not everyone who refuses Facebook or um, quits Facebook or breaks up with Facebook would say that they are taking um, an activist tactical response to power relations, I want to see it as a kind of struggle with um, the way people have been kind of recruited to these ubiquitous social networks. Um, so people are trying to do this kind of individualistic tactical move to negotiate that relationship. Um, and and this, the idea that people are providing unpaid labor could be one of the, the reasons that people feel uncomfortable with Facebook or uh, articulate their discomfort. It might not be a thing that people articulate as a discomfort, but it is something that um, critics of Facebook often um, say. And here uh, you can look to Tiziana Terranova's work on free labor and that idea that people who um, are using these sites are being exploited in a way. Value is being extracted from them and their activities. So in the free labor context, I argue that we can see opting out as refusal in the sense of the term used by autonomous theorists who write about the refusal of work. So Paolo Virno calls the refusal of work engaged withdrawal from the exploitative labor economy. In his formulation, to refuse to work is to question work as something that's just expected of humans as a matter of course. To refuse it is to say, wait, maybe we don't have to be in this kind of relationship. 
So refusing to be on Facebook can be a powerful move, a powerful individualistic move, but a powerful move toward distancing oneself from the less than wonderful aspects of the contemporary media economy, in which social network users do ever more work for corporations with ever less compensation and self-determination. At the same time though, this kind of refusing move carries different consequences for different subjects, meaning that opting out is less of an option for some than for others. And in this, media refusal is like all other forms of lifestyle activism. And I have a whole litany of examples of um, the way that uh, activist tactics done at sort of an individual scale are unevenly available to people from different subject positions. So the point I want to make here today is that given that social media networking often involves a kind of emotional labor, the tactic of refusal is less available to those who have to engage in emotional labor for a number of reasons. So these could be people whose professional identity is bound up with the emotional labor that they do, people whose social identity, if they're um, mothers or um, you know, other kinds of people whose social identity is bound up with caring, um, their self-identity, if you just think of yourself as like the kind of person who always has happy birthday on Facebook when it's someone's birthday, um, for, the, for that person to opt out, there's going to be a little bit of higher stakes there. So a lot of critical media theory right now is looking at effective labor and social media, but almost none of it is making what I see as kind of an object, ob, ob, obvious connection to a rich feminist tradition of theorizing care work and the gender dimensions of labor. Um, and one exception to this is a body of work by a lot of theorizing the web alums, uh, like uh, Alice, who I see here, Alice Marwick, and Gina Neff, and Betsy Wissinger, who gave a great talk in the last panel, and um, Brooke Duffy, um, who are writing about um, the various forms of social media labor undertaken by mostly feminine subjects. But here, the feminist sociologist work of Dorothy Smith, I find really useful. Um, and she puts, this, puts forward this idea that certain kinds of caring labor tend to be invisible, even in research on labor, because it's a kind of work that is performed as a matter of course by marginalized subjects. But when it's done well, it's actually invisible um, and not meant to be seen by those at the center who are usually the people these um, people are working for. So the example she gives in her work and that I think are useful for the, thinking through this are like domestic workers, people who clean your office, um, administrative assistants. These are people whose labor is not always visible. It's emotional labor. Um, and if they're doing it well, it, it wouldn't be visible to you. So overall, the labor of online social networking bears a striking resemblance to what has traditionally been constructed as women's work. As Kathy Weeks usefully summarizes in her recent study on the concept of work in capitalist culture, a major contribution of 1970s socialist feminist thought was to give recognition to the value generated by the skillful effort of caring for and sustaining families and their individual mem members effort that has historically been disproportionately expended by women. You may have heard of the Wages for Housework campaign. How many people have heard of Wages for Housework? Um, one goal of this campaign was to draw attention to the labor of women that was keeping society and the economy functioning smoothly. So inspired by feminist thinkers, I want to look at media refusal from a feminist standpoint that acknowledges and validates the caring labor performed by social media users. So I'm actually not going to talk here today about the pressures to participate experienced by people whose professional identities are linked to caring labor. Um, and this hopefully came through really clearly in the sex work panel last night um, and in Betsy, Betsy's presentation before. Um, but there's a lot to say about this and fortunately other theorizing the Webers are saying it. But looking at media refusal empirically as I've done in my research by of interviewing people who are um, walking away from Facebook and by sort of monitoring the public uh, press discussions of it, highlights the labor of social networking and the consequences of quote unquote walking off the job. Nearly all of the people I spoke and read about, uh, spoke with and read about in my Facebook refusal research said that their family or friend relationships had been affected by their non-participation on the site. Like it or not, 
Facebook is where weekend plans are made, happy birthdays are wished, new babies are displayed. And I find that many well-intentioned and well-reasoned critiques of Facebook participation, often from this kind of anti-capitalist um, position, tend to ignore or underestimate or, or understate the genuine expressions of care that are mediated through the platform. To say, for example, that time spent on Facebook stops us from giving love and affection to others, as um, Trevor Schultz said in his really great introduction to his book on digital labor, to say that assumes that we do not spend our Facebook time giving love and affection to others. And I think a lot of us do spend our time on Facebook that way. And especially perhaps those of us who have a social expectation of providing care for our social networks. And this certainly isn't just women, but I want to be clear that it is an expectation that is disproportionately applied to women. So while uh, we probably agree that it's problematic that relationships that we create and nurture online are mined as network data, walking away from these relationships may not be a realistic option for people who, for better or worse, depend on Facebook to enable their connections to others. And while people like Alice, like Trevor Schultz, have um, made this point that it, it, makes, it takes privilege to opt out, um, I really want to kind of drive home the this, this specific point that the emotional social costs of Facebook non-participation may be higher for those who carry the responsibility for maintaining family and community connectedness. And again, this is not just women, but it's definitely often aligned with a feminine subject position. So um, bear with me as I return to this marriage metaphor in contemplating our decidedly complicated relationship with Facebook, who often appears to be an irredeemable life partner. Like marriages, our continued relationships with social media platforms are freighted with temporal inertia and relationship baggage, meaning we stay because we've already invested the time. We fear the loss of social ties and identities were we to leave. This is why a lot of people who are kind of fed up with Facebook and its model, are like, eh, but I don't really feel like I can leave. So some people try to fix bad marriages, others file for divorce. But what are the consequences of walking away from one's relationship with Facebook? And so here I think that the valuable social work done by those who do have the wherewithal to opt out of the Facebook labor relation is to illuminate for the rest of us the consequences of making that choice and exposing the pressures of a system in which we do not all have equal freedom to make it. Next up is Adrian Massonari, and then we're going to have around 10 minutes for questions. If you want to get those in now, using the hashtag, the words E7. All right. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to be doing this a lot because all of my notes are down here. <laughs> um, so today I want to talk a little bit about Reddit and a particular community on Reddit called uh, Shit Reddit Says. Um, and we'll talk about the title of my talk um, in a little bit <laughs> later. Um, and I want to talk specifically about the notion of gender, how it plays out on Reddit, and this idea of counterperformance. Um, how many of you are familiar with Reddit? Look at that. So I'm not going to blow through this pretty much. Um, so Reddit, as you probably all know, is many things. Um, it's sort of a social news sharing site. It's, it could be considered a series of discussion boards, and it's a community, or actually multiple communities or subreddits. Um, users can submit, upvote and downvote material. They can subscribe to subreddits of interest. Um, and by default, you're subscribed to a certain set of default subreddits. Um, including things like Awe for Cats and Dogs, which is the best subreddit, um, <laughs> in my personal opinion, and Funny, which is supposed to be funny. It's not that funny. Um, so anyway, but one of the things that happens is that peop people customize their experience, Reddit experience, depending on their interests. So if you're into woodworking, there's a woodworking subreddit. If you're into um, Norwegian dark, dark metal, there is probably a Norwegian dark metal um, subreddit. I don't know why that came to me, but that's what it is. Anyway, so the front page shows the most highly upvoted material, most recent upvoted material, um, if you're not logged in. So lots of people who come to the site, if you ha don't have an account, you would see something like this. Um, here's some information about Reddit. Um, <laughs> you can see how many people have visited the site. Uh, you can see a timeline. This is from them. 
Uh, if you haven't heard about Reddit, although most of you did say you had, uh, it might have, you might have heard about it because of President Obama's Ask Me Anything session in 2012. Um, anybody can, can create a subreddit or community on Reddit and the code base is open source. Um, I want to talk today a little bit about Reddit's politics. Um, I say that Reddit's politics, discourse, and sort of general way of being are informed by the demographics of the site. So it's mostly male, college educated, Americans between 18 and 24. Um, probably straight, probably cisgendered, probably white, um, with some deviations. Um, I'd also like to add that the site is a hub for geek culture, um, so especially geek male culture. So fandom and gaming and tech communities are all heavily represented on the site. Um, so today, I'm reporting a part on part, a very small part, of a larger book project I'm working on about Reddit, which will be out next year, um, and how it reinforces and also challenges our ideas and understandings of participatory culture uh, more broadly. Um, it's based on almost three years of ethnographic fieldwork on the site, interviews with site users and moderators and all that jazz. Um, few notes before we dive in. So some conceptual ways to think about Reddit. We can think about Reddit as a carnival. And if you know Michelle Bakhtin's work, um, so the carnivalesque is the idea that during carnival, the hierarchies are upended. We revel in the grotesque body. We have this sort of irreverence of the established order. And sort of wit and depravity coexist. Um, we can also think about Reddit as a performance, as a performative space. It's a series of rituals that are performed for an audience. And we can understand it as play, as a form of collective play. And those things are pretty much all things that I'm not going to talk about in this talk. Um, <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about the carnival, but the other stuff is for other talks. Um, if you're interested, I would be happy to chat with you further. Um, today's talk is actually about understanding Reddit's sort of doxa, so the taken for granted rules and structures especially with regards to gender and how they're both supported and challenged by individuals within the community. Um, so one of the things that I think is really useful is to go back to um, Laura Mulvey. So Laura Mulvey, film critic, talks about the male gaze and the idea of women as objects and not to suggest that women don't have autonomy. But um, one suggestion is that we could consider Reddit as having a kind of male gaze. Um, so partially as a reflection of its demographics, um, but also if it's as a reflection of its role um, as a hub of geek masculinity, the site often devolves into problematic. <laughs> I know someone was tweeting about not using problematic, but it really is problematic. Problematic discourse about women and people of color. Um, although this manifests in many ways, uh, on the site, much of which I can't cover today. Um, the most obvious way we can see, th see this is through the so-called manosphere. So if you're familiar with the men's rights, subreddits, and the red pill, um, they often espouse misogynistic and retrograde views of women. Um, while the misogyny uh, and the manosphere is sort of very obvious, there is actually many other spaces on Reddit that are problematic for other reasons. Um, and because Reddit isn't just a community, it's a series of communities. It's not like the manosphere or people who inhabit the manosphere are hanging out just in the manosphere. Uh, they're also hanging out in places like Advice Animals, which is a uh, space for image macros and memes. Um, and so I want to talk briefly about three different images of women. So there is Scumbag Stacy. She is the female counterpart to Scumbag Steve, who does things like trash your house during a party without ha offering to clean up borrowing money and not paying it back. Uh, unfortunately, Stacy typically features a short story of deplorable behavior in other directions. She's a selfish, she's narcissist, she uh, has unwarranted resentment, um, she's clueless, and, she ha and she's adulterous, of, of course. Um, so often this behavior is displayed in the context of sort of a romantic or perceived romantic relationship with the person who posts this. On the other hand, we have the overly attached girlfriend. Stories of romance gone wrong. It's, just a, it's projecting the idea of the girlfriend as a clingy mess who is far more invested in the relationship than the person who creates the macro is. Um, uh, overly attached girlfriend macros are intended to be humorous, but they, the humor is based on exaggerations and stereotypical images of women as needy, unreasonable, and likely to stalk or be suspicious of current or former romantic partners. And lastly, <coughs> we have the good girl, Gina, um, who is the female counterpart of good guy Greg, which is another image macro on the site, usually 
used to report considerate things that someone might do, um, like cleaning up after himself after parties, or seeding torrents, or paying back more money than is required of him that he borrowed. Um, Gina is the idealized girlfriend. She offers to make dinner, is a willing sexual partner, and approves of her mate's lifestyle, so gaming, drug use, whatever, and doesn't friend zone men. <laughs> So it's impossible to spend time on Reddit without noticing the rampant amount of homophobic, transphobic, ableist, racist, sexist, ageist, et cetera, comments that exist. So it's one big trigger warning, and that's probably a slide that I put at the beginning, but whatever. Um, <laughs> but it's not just random comments or content in the default subreddits, or the, even the manosphere that kind of display these misogynistic tendencies. So as Reddit encapsulates internet culture more broadly, um, it's perhaps not surprising that multiple subs have been created and banned for distribu distributing clearly illegal content like child pornography and even the merely unethical, so pictures of, for example, women who are unsuspectedly photographed, creep shots, in public and then posted on Reddit for other people's sexual pleasure. Um, if you, in fact, if you had heard about Reddit in the other context, it might have been because of this person, Violent Acres, who was a prominent moder moderator on the site. Um, who was outed by Gawker's Adrian Chen. So enter Shit Reddit Says. Shit Reddit Says is a subreddit and community dedicated to raising awareness about Reddit's problems with discriminatory speech and offensive content. So they've collectively been involved in some of the efforts to eliminate child porn on the site and banning of jailbait and creep shot subreddits, although those keep moving around. Um, SRS contributors also highlight the highly upvoted comments um, in other p spaces on Reddit that they find problematic and post it to their subreddit. Um, it's important to note that you can kind of see here that actually for all of their postings, the upvote and downvote arrows are reversed. Um, and we'll talk more about this later. It's part of their CSS file. Uh, so to really understand what's going on in SRS, and this is where things kind of get complicated and crazy, uh, is that you have to understand another aspect of Reddit community, um, which is the circle jerk. Um, this is actually a subreddit dedicated to critiquing Reddit's hive mind, so the tendency for the same tired memes and ways of being and ways of interacting to be shared and upvoted. Um, for example, one key point of discussion on this subreddit is always the notion that Redditors are fedora-wearing, raging atheist, neckbeard geeks who have no idea how to talk to women. Right? So that's a theme that comes up, um, and they play on particular topics that are trending in some of the other more popular subreddits. Um, breaking the circle jerk, or otherwise taking it seriously, can get one banned from the sub. So SRS functions in much the same way. It is a circle jerk, but uh, rather than humorously poking fun at Reddit's doxa, ways of being, um, it's focused on highlighting problematic speech. Um, this is a safe space where explanations about why stuff might be problematic and a, an issue are not really required. Um, and I also want to say sidebar that SRS actually ho houses a series of other SRS-oriented subreddits um, it's called the SRS Fempire. So if you go to the SRS Fempire, you can see versions of SRS gaming and technology and stuff that are sort of their own little community inside of Reddit. So this is where the title of the talk comes from. Uh, you might guess that much of Reddit is not exactly thrilled about SRS. Uh, they're often invoked in any discussion that gets heated around gender or racial politics, um, and they're ac accused of being a downvoting brigade, which both the moderators of the SRS community and the site admins have said is not true, you know, or no more so true than any other subreddit. Um, a number of anti-SRS subreddits exist, SRS su uh, sucks, anti-SRS and the ominously named SRS mythos, <laughs> so to um, explain the origins of the site. Um, and there's postings like this, and this is currently the most highly upvoted posting on SRS of all time, um, where they're accused of doxing individuals, um, shutting down free speech, and not engaging with the rest of Reddit correctly. Um, and much of the dominant discourse suggests that SRS comes to the site just to bitch about it, as if these individuals aren't legitimate members of the community already. Um, it becomes a boogeyman trotted out in any thread where people challenge the often impressive othering views of gender, race, sexuality, disability status, etc. Um, that a lot of Redditors do express. Not everybody, um, but some. Uh, the SRS mods I talked to suggested that they were simply fed up with getting downvoted when trying to engage with Redditors on the site. Um, as one said, quote, I have been heavily involved in the gaming community and was tired of the constant onslaught of racist, sexist, and homophobic jokes and comments. SRS let me know that I wasn't alone. It was a space where I finally had people who thought the shit 
this shit wasn't funny, and the stuff they found funny, so did I. SRS let me know that my voice was allowed and that I wasn't crazy. Thus, carving out a space where they can create their own forms of play, their own carnival, where the carnival nature of Reddit is further inverted to critique the dominant discourse that the much, large, much of the larger community relies upon. Um, and it is interesting to note that um, Reddit doesn't have problems with other people critiquing it. Um, and William Shatner is actually a very prolific uh, Redditor. He's on Star Trek all the time. And um, he had a, a posting where he actually called out a lot of Reddit's um, proclivity towards racist and sexist comments. Um, but he received some very thoughtful comments. So what I think is interesting is that someone like uh, William Shatner, his critique is not only accepted but outlawed because he's a community insider, right? And we see this in other spaces where of geek culture and geek masculinity where they intersect. So things like Anita Sarkeesian's, you know, tropes versus women's uh, videos, you know, her critique, everyone in the gaming community, not everyone, but numbers of the gaming community said, well, you're not part of our community, so you don't deserve to critique us, um, which is not true, but also it's problematic for many reasons. Um, so tensions like these, of course, of who belongs and who doesn't, of this idea of authenticity, of who is allowed to speak, are common in all kinds of communities. Um, but I think the technological logics of Reddit and the internet more broadly make these moments both more dramatic and more public. And I know I'm running out of time, but I'm going to talk about this for a second. Um, so why does Reddit culture support, on the one hand, a kind of playfulness and altruistic behavior, which it does, which I'm not talking about today, but it does, um, and a lot of alienating discriminatory speech? So is the greater internet fuckwad theory correct? So gift, is gift correct? Is it just about anonymity? As Lisa Nakamura noted recently, this is, allows people to get off too easily. It's not just community spaces like Reddit or Xbox Live Chatter or newspaper comment sites. Um, it's culture more broadly. And dismissing people as just normal folks hiding behind anonymity is too simplistic. OK, so maybe it's because of this. Maybe it's our desire for drama and popcorn. And I'm as guilty of this as anyone, right? So this karma mechanic on the website encourages potential bandwagon effect, where top-rated content and comments achieve more fame and become more visible because they're top-rated. So the nature of drama on Reddit plays out, and the internet more broadly, um, it's tied inextricably to the audience for whom that drama is, um, is created. And so the spectators revel in some cases in the drama, pulling out the popcorn or folding chair to watch a good show. I should put the folding chair in there. But I think what's really missing from the gift theory, or the gif theory, is the notion of platform politics, which I'm glad to see a lot of people have been talking about. Um, how do platforms create technological logics that encourage certain kinds of discourse and silent others? Um, so anyone can use Reddit. Anyone can create uh, a community on Reddit. Anyone can use the code. It's open source. And certainly, the creators of Reddit embody much of the open source ethos, right? So they're very loath to intervene um, in conflicts that occur um, because of free speech issues, um, and only reluctantly ban subreddits, even if the content is objectionable. But the algorithmic logic of Reddit, where upvotes and downvotes determine visibility, as Alex Levitt talked about yesterday, um, has a huge impact on all this. But what I find most interesting about the SRS and the Fempire is that the community purposely exists in the space of Reddit, right? It's hoping to annoy, to frustrate, and perhaps serve as a reminder that many people are not OK with the kind of discourse that dominates this community sometimes. But they don't move elsewhere. They're not moving off of Reddit to other spaces. And that's because they are part of this community. Um, the mods themselves have talked about uh, you know, that this is a very important part of the community. They're, they find a lot of value in many of the other subreddits. Um, so they are a part of the community. So SRS in general, in closing, I just want to mention, becomes an important example of counterperformance, which is an idea borrowed from Jeffrey Alexander. So by inverting the technological logics of Reddit's voting system, making upvotes, downvotes, and vice versa, the mods say they are interested in highlighting the shit Reddit says, thus making this stuff still visible instead of hiding it underneath a sea of downvotes. Their point is that the toxic stuff some Redditors are spewing deserves to be seen by the community as a whole. In conclusion, we need to be cognizant of all of these aspects of internet culture, how users, anonymity, audiences, spectatorships, and platform politics tend to silence some voices while privileging others. And I'm glad to see a lot of people are talking about this and thinking about this. Um, and we need to think more critically about how these, 
<coughs> how these um, factors may encourage performances of both play and bullying. Um, most importantly, we need to understand the ways in which counterperformances might serve as important um, kind of modes for online communities to challenge and invert these dominant discourses. And thank you. Thanks. So we have just a couple minutes for questions. First, I think we have questions on our hashtag. Um, yeah, a couple on Reddit, actually. Um, Before you know. Sure. Um, so one more person just wanted to know if the correct interpretation of SRS's logo as an angry bird um, was a bird as a diminutive form of term for a woman. Um, and then another person wanted to know, by Reddit's politics, do you mean the politics of the technology and organization or the politics performed there? Uh, both good questions. Uh, I don't know about the first one. I'm going to have to <laughs> beg off on ignorance. That's a good question, and I will find out. Um, and tweet at that person later if they tweet at me. Um, the second question, I think uh, both. So the question was if the technology of, can you just say it quickly again? Yeah, Sorry. the politics of the technology slash organization or the yeah. politics performed there. It's both. I mean, I think they're inextricably linked on Reddit. And um, there's a lot of really, I mean, Reddit is an amazing space. Like, I, I wouldn't be on there doing an ethnography of Reddit if I didn't really enjoy lots of parts of it. So um, despite the fact that I'm being critical of it doesn't mean that I don't enjoy it as a community and don't get something out of it. But I do think the ways in which it's, it's sometimes as an or like both as the administrative policy and organization have really promoted this idea of discourse and open rational discussions, but at the same time is sort of not maybe always doing everything it can to promote that mm -hmm. um, and to give moderators the tools to promote that in the subreddits as well. That's it. Thanks. Do we have more on the hashtag? Yeah, but they're posted by me, so I'll wait on Do we have questions from the audience not on the hashtag? Yeah. Go for it. Yeah, um, for Adrian as well. Um, I, I teach uh, computational journalism at Columbia. And one of the things we spend a lot of time on is the design of moderation and filtering systems. And your comment, you know, uh, spaces like this are going to privilege some voices more than others. Yeah, that's the point of, of a moderation system. So given that you can't escape the fact that there's far too much for any one person to read, how do we help? Thanks. <laughs> how do we design our moderation systems to make them better? That's a great Great question. Um, so I've been talking to some of the mods, and one of the things that they're critiquing about Reddit's moderation tools is that it's very difficult to do this sort of hardline moderation without going to third-party tools on Reddit. So I think one of the things that they they say is that the uh, you know because I ask I sort of ask everybody I'm talking to like what kinds of things would improve your experience of with Reddit, and for moderators, it's almost always we would really appreciate having you know, the, the admins of the site release tools that actually help us do our jobs better. Um, because I don't think that a lot of the moderators care about the communities that they're, I mean, they're subreddits and don't want to be, you know, dealing with, um, they may have very different ideas about what they consider toxic content, right? But they want to be, have those tools to do that and moderate that. And I think the problem is right now that they're all third party designed. And that's really what, I mean, I think in some ways, this is the blessing and curse of open source, right? Reddit has really depended heavily both on volunteer labor, um, the sort of open source community to contribute stuff, which people have done willingly, but it also means that then they don't have to really take ownership into making stuff um, always, you know, work to help the moderation things. I don't know if that helps Can you answer. Give an example of a useful third-party tool. Uh, no, I can't right now. Have that. Thanks. <laughs> so we got time for one or two more questions on the aisle there. Or yeah, go for it. Hey, uh, <clears throat> I had a question for uh, Laura Metz. Um So yeah, you drew the distinction between um, like two types of publics in uh, you know queer movements like the queer radical side mm -hmm. and the kind of mainstream assimilating side, and I definitely see that too. Um, but I wondered like how much, to what extent does that, is there that divide um, in the South? So, um, right, so 
it does it's surprising but we have bigger towns there and so like um, so within Charlotte and uh, even Raleigh Durham is a bigger area for us so maybe it's a matter of degree and not kind there's definitely are like Durham North Carolina is a super cool place but it's not big by the standards of New York City but there's definitely an element of a more queer radical culture that looks at somewhere like Bakersville or somewhere else like well I, I, I don't want to talk about sin and salvation. That's ridiculous. We got to move beyond that. And so there is some tension between those groups sometimes. And um, and then the people in Vegas are like, yeah, but these are our neighbors. We need to deal with this, and we need to persuade them how we can. And so um, I, I do think it's a distinction that exists everywhere, um, but maybe not the only distinction we need to pay attention to. Um, I was very interested by your talk, thank you, and I was wondering, um, um, we can think of non-participation on Facebook as an individual tactic of resistance, but I was wondering if you also observed collective, collective movements or tactics such as Facebook groups, like let's all quit Facebook on this date, and yeah. uh, what happened to these groups, did it fail or did it succeed, and uh, uh, also, do these people leave Facebook to go on other platforms to participate in other collective uh, distinction between participation and non-participation is, uh, I think, very interesting and you, you framed it in, in an interesting way. Great. Um, so thank you for that question, um, or for those questions. Um, to answer the first part, are there collective um, movements of resistance to Facebook or other social networks, yes. Um, there's the National um, Day of Unplugging, which is um, sponsored by this group called Reboot. Um, that actually is uh, its more of a religiously motivated, um, it's, they also have this thing called the Sabbath Manifesto, this idea that we should take one day a week to be away from our technology. Um, and there, there are groups like that that definitely are, I would say, more kind of lifestyle focused, like more saying, well, for our own benefit, we would have a better quality of life if we stepped away from these technologies. I think of those as a, a bit different than the kind of overtly politically motivated um, groups that are actually kind of critiquing Facebook's economic model. Um, there was a campaign called Quit Facebook Day that I think was in 2011. Um, that was really um, motivated by uh, a critique of power and a critique of the economics, but um, perhaps predictably, when it got kind of covered in media, uh, it, that part got kind of diluted out. And the more kind of individualistic problems people experience, the kind of micro experience of their problems with Facebook kind of rose to the top of the discourse. Um, and so I think, while I do think people are still like, perhaps in an unconscious way, working out their political problems, um, that often is not what gets mobilized around or what gets the media coverage or what gets um, uh, used as kind of a, a basis for a collective movement. So it does often get sort of reduced again to my individual problems, not my individual problems, but people's individual problems. Um, and so, yeah, so I would kind of want to see a more um, collective discourse about the, the problems with the Facebook model and social networking um, rise, while not ignoring some of those, um, the, the work that goes on there, uh, the care work that, that goes on there. Um, the second part of your question was, you know, whether participation and non-participation is like a, you know, a binary thing, and absolutely not. Um, People who, the people I talked to were specifically not on Facebook, but a lot of them were on Twitter or other social networks. And in fact, in my uh, earlier work on refusal as kind of a performance, um, I talk about how for a lot of people, they actually were using Facebook, but kind of publicly they said they weren't. Um, or they had a partner whose Facebook profile they would kind of sneak onto, or they had a secret <laughs> Facebook name. and so. For them, what really was important was making that statement about not being on it and, and maybe using that as like a, a political mobilizer, but they did actually use it. So the practice is a little bit different than the discourse. 
Unfortunately, we're out of time. Give our participants a round of applause.